Okay, so now we consider the discussion on the Lagrange condition. Uh, now we look at example. Remember that the Lagrange condition tells a way to specify the necessary condition for a minimizer uh, subject to an equality constraint. So suppose we have a example like this. <clears throat> we have a fixed area of uh, the area is A, specified as A. We have this A as the total area, fixed area of a cardboard. They want to uh, make up uh, a cardboard board box using this uh, available materials. I want to reach the maximum volume of this. Then uh, the question is how should we choose the size of this box? And uh, um, apparently this is a optimization problem with a constraint where the total area has to be uh, less than or equal to A, or has to be equal to A. Um, now, the dimension of the box, we know that it can be, has, has three dimensions, so we want to make a box right here, okay? And uh, say so this side is x1, this side is x2, this side is x3. So the volume is equal to x1 times x2 times x3. That's the thing that we're trying to ma maximize. And the, the uh, the surface which has the fixed area A should be equal to the six faces, right? The area of the six faces. So we're trying to maximize this. As they said, this is the volume of this box. And the surface um, has this area. This part, this part means that the, the area of the bottom, because we have x1 here, x2 here, right? And x2, x3 is this is this side, and x3, x1 is this side, and uh, this is just half of the area. We have another uh, uh, one of them, each, for each one of them. So total is two times this, that's equal to two, that's equal to A. So that's our optimization problem. We have three numbers, x1, x2, x2, x3 to find, and we want to maximize the product of them subject to this constraint. So apparently the F is negative of this because we're trying to change this to minimize, so we put a negative here. So the f of x is minus this. And the h of x, since we only have one constraint, the h of x is just a scalar value function. That just be, uh, so this one is equal to, we can divide both sides by two and then move this a over two to the left. So we want this to be equal to zero, right? So the h of x is this. So remember that the Lagrange condition is just uh, f plus h times lambda. The lambda has the same dimension as h, but h is a scalar value, so lambda is a scalar as well. So the L of uh, the Lagrange function is just a f of x plus hx times lambda. So this is the f of x, and this is a hx, and this is scalar lambda. All right, and now we can consider the Lagrange condition. As we said, a shortcut to memorize this, easy way to memorize this, it's just a take the derivative with respect to x, set to zero, take the derivative with respect to lambda, set it to zero. And these two together gives us the long range condition. Okay, so now let's recall what that is. Uh, we take the derivative with respect to x1 of this thing. We see that we'll get negative x2, x3, and then we have x2 times lambda, and also x3 times lambda. Okay, so that's what we have. So it's x2, x3 minus uh, this. Uh, I think I have, yeah, I use, the, I use the negative of this. But it doesn't matter. I want this to be 0 or negative of this to be 0. They're equivalent. So I should have negative here. Or I should have plus. But uh, if I said negative of this, so there should be a negative here as well. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't really matter, as I said. Uh, you want hx equal to 0. It's the same as you want negative uh, of h, negative h of x equal to zero. Okay, so that's the first three. So this is like the partial derivative of L with respect to x1 equals this. Partial derivative of L with respect to x2 is this, and then x3 is this. The last one is the partial derivative of L with respect to lambda. Uh, actually, that is just the h itself, because when we take a derivative with respect to lambda, you only have h of x. So you have this equals zero. So do we have four unknowns x1 through x3 plus this lambda. And we have four of these equations, and we can try to solve it. And in this case, we solve it, only have one solution 
out of this system, and they are this. And it totally makes sense because if you want to maximize the uh, volume, the best way is to make a perfect cube, right? All these three lenses are the same, x1, x2, x3 are the same. And in this case, the, uh, it will be just equal to that. And in this case, the uh, the volume will be just equal to, so this is the x1, the, the volume will be just the, this cube. Okay, that's the maximum volume you can make out when the surface area is fixed to be A. Okay, and the lambda you don't really need this value, but it's just a byproduct when you solve it. Uh, and what you really need is just like the values of x. Okay, so they just coincide with our intuition. Or um, I think some um, intuition we know uh, how to make the box as large as possible given fixed area. Okay. Now let's consider another example. Um, <clears throat> uh, suppose we're trying to minimize the x1 square plus x2 square subject to uh, this constraint equals to 1. So what this one uh, is, uh, so geometrically you actually can think the constraint here tells us that the point x1, x2 needs to be on an ellipse where this x1, x2 you want this to be equal to 1 so that means x it will be an ellipse at say 1 here, one negative 1 here and here is 1 over root 2 here is negative 1 over root 2 we will have an ellipse here so my point must be on this ellipse, on this, on this ellipse, okay? At the same time, I want to minimize my x1 square plus x2 square, which is like the square distance of the point to the origin. And that apparently is this point or this point, okay? Apparently that's the case here. So, um, because that's the closest point, the point closest to the origin. Right? So that's geometric meaning. But let's see how do we actually get this uh, using the Lagrange condition or using uh, the first order uh, the Lagrange uh, theorem. So uh, we we have the minimization problem. So here this is the f of x where x has x1 and x2. Okay, and uh, uh, we have this h. So I can make this minus one to be h. I want this to be equal to zero. So it's minimizing f subtract to minimizing f subtract to h x equal to zero. So Lagrange condition, our Lagrange function apparently is just uh, this f of x plus lambda times h, right? And then the Lagrange condition is the partial derivative of this with respect to x1, then with respect to x2, then with respect to lambda. Okay, so it should be l here, a little l here. Okay, and uh, the three together gives us this three, so this, this, and the last one is essentially just h, right? This part is just a, always just h x. Okay, then we have this, and then we need to solve for x one, x two, and the lambda, right? And in this case, we will get uh, four points, four possible choices. Okay, four possible choices. Uh, and then we can check if this x1, x2, lambda is equal to that. That means the point we have here will be just this, which is 0, uh, 1 root 2. That is what I wrote here is this point. Okay, it's easy to check that. Uh, you check the function value at this point. You will have 0 for this here and the 1 over root of 2 here. So the result is 1 half. That's the function value at this point. And similarly, the it will be function value will be one over two at this point. And then we also have this another two points, this and then this. And this is corresponding to this one zero is corresponding to this point. And then uh, negative one zero is the corresponding to this point. And the function value at these two points uh, is equal to one or negative one plus zero, which is one. So that's bigger than the one half we had earlier at these two points. 
Okay, so actually these two points will reach the local minimum, or actually these two local minimum are actually also global because there is no other point that can be even smaller than this. So these two local minimum are actually global minimum, and these two points are actually local maximum and also global maximum. Okay, and as you can see, when we solve the kick, uh, when we solve the Lagrange condition, uh, we get these four points, but they are just candidates for our uh, solution, just like green apple x equals to zero for me for solving um unconstrained problem we minimize f of x the gradient f of x give, can give us both uh local maximizer or local minimizer or even set up uh, even uh, set of points and the same thing here we got this four point but they are just candidates and we need to further check which one really have smaller function value and apparently this first two gives us or these two points give us the minimum value and these two points give us the maximum value all right so now uh, uh, what do we just consider our uh, consider is the Lagrange condition which is called the first order condition meaning that if we only consider the you only need the, the gradient or we only use the gradient what the gradient needs to satisfy just like the uh, the condition here right this is the gradient so it's the first order uh, Derivative of L of the Lagrange function. Now let's consider the second order uh, condition. Okay, so we're going to do the do the same um, as before. Suppose we have this surface, which is the omega, and then we have a point x star on this omega, and then we have this tangent plane, and then we have this y, which is on this tangent plane, then. Uh, we know there is a curve that's living on this omega and is passing through this x star and the tangent line at this point x star is equal to y right that's what we have been doing for the for first order necessary condition so this y suppose x star is a local minimizer this y is uh, a point is a vector in the tangent space then we know there exists x such that uh, the x of t is x is x star is passing through x star at when t when uh, uh, when it's at t and the derivative of x at t is equal to one. Okay, uh, and then again we let's check the function value check the function value along the curve. The, remember the curve is for any s in this in this uh, interval a b it will be mapped to x of s which is on this omega. So we're checking the function value for different s so phi of s just f of x s and then the first order derivative is equal to this we know that this needs to be uh, because it's the when t uh, when it's at the x star or s equals to t uh, we should reach the local minimum so this should be equal to zero but that's for the first order as the condition we know that this should be equal to zero right that's what we did before but also we want to check the second order if it's a local minimizer then the function value should be uh, reach the minimum there so it's like if we track the function value along this curve we'll see that say this is t this is the a this is the b you should reach the minimum here and then increase so that's why the derivative here should be equal to zero and the, the second order derivative here should be greater than or equal to zero because it should be convex convex shape here right so that's the second order condition we need the second order derivative of uh, phi prime to be second order derivative of phi prime to be greater than or equal to zero so now uh, phi prime itself is this or this part we take the second order derivative with respect to, we need to take a derivative with respect to t one more time and you can see that t appears here and here so we need to use the product rule first to take the derivative of the t here and that will give us let me rewrite that so the phi i should say that the phi s uh, is already here let me just use that so the phi of s is okay i need to take the first order derivative and that has been done above i just copy what we have there so the phi of 
s is f of x s. The phi prime s is equal to gradient f of x s transpose x s. Okay, remember that <coughs> this is a column vector. This is a column vector. So you take an inner product of two vectors, we'll get a scalar. And again, the f double prime of s, we need to take a derivative of the first s. So that will give us the um, Jacob, sorry, that should give us the Haitian f x s, and then the derivative of inside, which is f x prime s. Then this transpose times x s, right? Plus, uh, sorry, this should be x prime. Should be x prime, and then we need to take a derivative of the second s, which is gradient f of x s transpose of the second s will be x double prime s. Right, and now we just evaluate s at t. When x equals to t, I know that this is just the x star, and then this is just equal to y, and this is also equal to y. Right, so that's why we have. This one here is just this. And the, the Haitian is symmetric matrix. The F is twice differentiable. So the uh, second order derivative, partial derivatives are all, you know, when you take the you take the Haitian, it will be a symmetric matrix. If F is con if it's twice continue continue uh, twice differentiable and the derivative is continuous. The second order derivative is continuous. This means that the second order derivative of this exists and uh, they are continuous. Okay, so this is a symmetric matrix. That's why I take a transpose of it it's just itself. And this becomes a Y. That's what I put on here. Right? So when you put the transpose of this, I'll get, you get that. And this term is left. It's just this term. Okay, so that's the second order derivative. And I need it to be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, but the issue with this one is that I really don't have a and don't have any idea about what this one is. I do have idea about the others. This is just the just the Haitian of f at x star, and I know this is the y, which is any tangent, any vector in the tangent place, uh, tangent space. And uh, this I know that's just the first order derivative of f, but I really don't know what this one is. So uh, how do we resolve uh, this issue? How do we make this one greater than equal to really something that we can use to to justify? A necessary condition for the local minimizer x. I we need to do one more step. Okay, this one more step is this. Remember, we just used the, the function value. We just used the function value because we know that x of x uh, is a curve on this omega, so we can track its function value, and this is where we can get that first order that have equals equals zero because x because it's a local minimizer at s equals to t, and also the this is greater than or equal to zero when is the local minimizer at uh, s equal to t. But I haven't used uh, the property that this h of s is actually on omega, or in other words, h of x of s is equal to zero. This is what the condition is, the constraint is. So let's say that we, def we further define the psi of s, because we have uh, m constraints, h1 through hm. So for each of these constraints, I know that I should have x one of h one of x equals zero all the way to h m of x equals zero. Or in other word, I should have uh, because x x s is a curve on the omega, so I know that it should be equal to zero for for s in the interval a b. And similarly, I should have this equal to zero. So I have m of this. So I just define my psi 1 of s to be this, and psi m of s to be this. And I know that for all the s in the interval, this is equal to 0. So when I take the derivative twice, it should give us 0 as well. And when I take the derivative twice, we do the same. It's the same similar as before. Instead of having f here, we have the h1 here. So for each one of them, uh, we will get this. That's just exactly the same as before, except f is replaced 
with this hi. Okay, that happens for every i, for every constant, i is from 1 to n. So we actually have this. Well, uh, again, it, we have this x double prime here, which we don't know what it is, but uh, the good thing is that this is equal to 0, because the this is a constant function of s. So if you take the derivative twice, it's still equal to 0. All right, so now let's combine this one with the one we have in the previous page to form this second order condition. Uh, to this, we will see what is multiplied to x double prime. Here is this vector multiplied to double x double prime, and here this is this gradient f is multiplied to the x double prime. But there is a relation between the gradient f and the gradient hi's. Remember the Lagrange condition. For Lagrange condition, we know there exists some lambda star such that uh, the gradient f plus a linear combination of the columns here using the coefficients lambda star gives us zero. And what this one is, remember this, originally this one is just a Jacobian of h, means that the rows are the gradient of hi's. Now I make transpose, that means the columns are the gradient of hi's. And now I make a, make a con linear combination of them, so it's just a linear combination of the gradient of hi's. Right? And this, we know that there exists some lambda i star such that this plus this equal to zero. Okay, so now remember that I just copied what I had earlier. So y, tra y transpose gradient square is lambda of f at x star y plus the gradient of f of x star transpose x double prime of t equals zero. And for each i, I also have this. So this is true for any i from 1 to m. Now I know that when I multiply the lambda i to this gradient h i, and then take the sum, then sum, and add this to gradient f, I should get zero. And now what I need to do is just uh, I need to multiply each one of this by lambda i, and then uh, I have m of this, and then all together I add this first one as well. I have m plus one of them. I sum them together, then they will have this part, and the lambda i times this part. Because I, I multiply lambda i, yeah, just right here, lambda i times this, which is a zero. I know that I would just essentially have the lambda i here and also lambda i here, right? Lambda i multiplied here. Here and here. So I know that if I add up these equations, the second term it will give me this thing times x double prime, but this thing is equal to zero. So it doesn't matter what x double prime is, we will just get rid of this thing. And then what we only have left is just this plus the lambda i times each of this. Okay, lambda i times this, and then uh, sum together. Okay, and that essentially just the y are still on the two sides, and in the middle I have this times lambda 1 times Haitian plus lambda 1 times Haitian of H1 plus lambda 2 times Haitian of H2, so on and so forth. So we have these terms in the middle. Okay, so we cancel the x double prime term, but we only have this left. And this is greater than or equal to 0. This should, must be greater than or equal to 0 for any y in the tangent space. Okay, for any y in the tangent space. So this is the second order necessary condition. If at x star is a local minimizer, then for any y in the tangent space of x star, this needs to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, for the same lambda uh, that you have in the Lagrange condition. Okay, to satisfy the Lagrange condition, which is the first order necessary condition, we know there exists some lambda star such that. Uh, do we have that? Such that this. Uh, such that this equal to zero, right? And for the second order uh, necessary condition, uh, we should we should check we should have that this uh, for any y in the tangent space of x star, uh, this when we multiply y to the two sides of this matrix which is the Haitian of f plus the Haitian of the hi's using the lambda i star as the coefficients, 
is needs to be must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, apparently, if this one itself is a non-negative definite, then this must be true for any y. But you don't really need that. Uh, we want this one uh, doesn't have to be the negative definite as long as that we multiply any y from this space, which is just subspace of R n. You can make this greater than or equal to zero. That will be enough. Okay. So this one itself it doesn't have to be uh, uh, non-negative definite. It just needs to be non-negative definite with respect to the y it's in here in this space, in the tangent space. Okay, so we summarize the result. X, uh, X, X star be a local minimizer of f over the uh, feasible set, which is specified by the equality constraint h of x equal to zero, where m is less than equal to n, uh, fh, they are uh, twice continuously differentiable, and the suppose this x star is regular, this is all everything we said so far is just uh, standard. Um, x star is a regular point, meaning that the Jacobian of h at x star is, has full row rank, then there exists, so this here comes the next, second order nexus condition, there exists the x star, uh, it's an dimensional vector such that the first uh, uh, the kick, the Lagrange condition must be satisfied, which means that this needs to be zero. Uh, secondly, for any va uh, for any vector y in the tangent space of x star, this which is a number is must be greater than equal to zero. Okay, uh, this is number is so obvious. This is the matrix square matrix. This is a row vector. This is the column vector. Okay, so it's like row vectors, uh, square matrix is a column vector. They are all n-dimensional vectors, and this y that we multiply to the two sides as, needs to be from the tangent space. As long as is, this is greater than or equal to zero for the vectors in the tangent space, then uh, we see that this one has satisfied the second order necessary condition. Okay, again, this is a necessary condition. If x is a local minimizer, then this must be satisfied. But if you know this is satisfied, it doesn't mean that it's a, it's a uh, local minimizer. Okay? It's, not, it's not sufficient condition. Okay? And here, uh, just recall, if it's a problem, it's not, it's unconstrained, we minimize f of x, then we say that x is a local minimizer, then the gradient f of x must be equal to zero. And now it becomes this is equal to zero for some lambda star. And also, when we say it's local minimizer, the Haitian of x must be, sorry, must be greater than or equal to zero, or must be uh, non negative definite, non negative definite, and that becomes this one. Uh, we just need to make sure this uh, is kind of non negative definite with respect to the vector y's in the uh, tangent space. Okay, so it's like this is the Haitian, but it's not the, the Haitian as before. It, it doesn't have to be itself doesn't have to be non negative definite. As we said, as long as you put vectors y from this space is greater than equal to zero, that will be enough. Okay, you can also consider the uh, the second order sufficient condition, uh, which is similar as before. Again, you just have the uh, you just have this omega. Right? And you have this point x star, you have this tangent plane, you have this y, you have this curve. And if, it's a, if you can show that the derivative is equal to zero, uh, so you check the function value along this curve, which is this, and that the derivative is equal to zero as, as, as equal to t, and the, the second order derivative of, of phi at t, as equal to t is greater, really greater than equal to, really greater than zero then we can claim that x star is a, a local, strict local minimizer, all right? And that's, again, uh, just following the discussion before, check the second order derivative, and also use the property that uh, this, is equal to, this is equal to zero to cancel out the x double prime, then we can end up with that this is greater than zero, okay? So for any y in the tangent space, if this is strictly greater than or equal to zero, uh, for any non-zero y from the tangent space, then we can claim that x star is a strict local minimizer. Okay, this is a sufficient condition, meaning that as long as we can find this, 
it must be a local minimizer. But it's not uh, necessary. Uh, we could find some local minimizer that has this greater than or equal to zero, but not strictly greater than zero. But it's still a local minimizer, right? So this is a key difference between the sufficient condition and necessary condition to here. So the difference between the second order of necessary condition and the sufficient condition is in this last one here, right? Um, previously, for the necessary condition, this needs to be greater than or equal to zero for any y uh, in the tangent space. And uh, here, for a sufficient condition, we need this to be strictly greater than or equal to zero for any non-zero y here. Okay? We want non-zero because if it is zero, then it has to be equal to zero. So it doesn't help. It doesn't, uh, it's not useful. Only when the y is non-zero, and it is from the column space, uh, is from the tangent space, and this is greater than zero, and that means um, it is a local minimizer. It's just like the, for the unconstrained case, as before. Uh, if we if you show that the Haitian the Haitian at x star is is positive definite, then that means the x star is a, a, a local minimizer, a local minimizer, and similar thing here. Okay, but they just need to be uh, strictly positive with respect to the y's in the uh, the tangent space. Okay, now let's look at example. Okay, um, <clears throat> suppose we're trying to maximize this uh, ratio where we have the uh, x transpose qx, q and p are even matrices. Um, the q is just a diagonal matrix with a 4 and 1 on the diagonal. <coughs> p is another one. With uh, 2 and 1 on the diagonal. And we're trying to maximize this ratio. So numerator gives us a scalar. Uh, similar de denominator gives us a scalar. OK, to maximize it. <coughs> but so far, it's not a constraint problem. right? There is no constraint here. Uh, but actually, we can convert it into a constraint one and solve it easy, uh, very easily. The, um, to convert it to constraint form, first uh, <coughs> look at First, we'll look at the uh, uh, the property here. If we scale this x by any by x by any uh, scalar, it doesn't change the value, right? For example, if we multiply x by any scalar t, uh, it doesn't change because you have a t here, t here, but I also have t on the bottom. So as long as t is a non-zero, the ratio doesn't change. So let's say that we just need to make sure. That the denominator is equal to one. We scale with this x such that this is equal to one, and let's see how we maximize the numerator. Okay, so that this problem becomes the minimizing. So we are maximizing the numerator such that this equals to one. Denominator equals to one. So the denominator is equal to one is this, and we're maximizing the numerator is minimizing the negative of the numerator, right? So now here this one is f of x, and this is h of x. All right. Okay. Now let's uh, try the uh, uh, let's consider the Jacobian of H. So H is this. We know that Jacobian of H will be the just take the derivative. Uh, since H is a scalar valued scalar valued function, uh, the Jacobian will be just a just a vector, which is. We know take the derivative of this with respect to x, it will give us 2 times px, since p is metric, 2 times px. And because the p is diagonal matrix, so the 2 times px is just 4x1, 2x1. This is the, uh, the Jacobian. Uh, this is the Jacobian there. All right, <clears throat> now let's also consider the, the uh, Lagrange condition. So here, what do we said? Uh, since we know the Jacobian now, we, we also know that this one will be a it's, a, it's actually a, um, the run can be either one or zero because uh, it's a two by one or one by two. Uh, it depends on what you want to look at this. If it's a Jacobi, we should treat it as a one by two. So it should be a row vector. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as long as one of these two 
is non-zero, this is a rank one matrix because it's a vector, uh, non-zero vector. Okay, so as long as x is not zero, x is a regular point. All right, so now let's look at the Lagrange function. Uh, Lagrange function is this. This is the f, this is lambda times h, and then Lagrange condition is the gradient with respect to x that gives us this equal to zero. So again, just to take the derivative of this with respect to x, we should get gradient of x with respect to x. We should get negative two qx. Right? This is because we know that we take the gradient of one half x transpose qx. For the quadratic function, we know this is just qx. Now without a one half, we just have two qx, and we have negative there as well. Then plus <coughs> lambda is constant, and we have two lambda px. Okay, and then uh, we'll put the we extract the negative two outside, we just have this. This is equal to zero. And also the gradient with respect to lambda is just hx. So that's just hx equals zero. So we need to uh, combine these two and try to solve for the x star and the lambda star. Okay, oh sorry, this should be lambda star here. This should be lambda star. All right. Uh, and also the lambda is just a scalar, so I can write this just regular uh, letter, uh, not the bold faced. All right, the first one, solving the first one tells us that the uh, we can cancel the negative two, and that we just have uh, Q uh, minus lambda star P times X star equals to zero, right? And that we can see that um, we can move the lambda star PX star to the right. We have the Q X star equals to lambda star P X star. And then we can multiply the P inverse on both sides. This is, this is scalar, so I can move it around. Now we can multiply p inverse because p is the diagonal matrix to one, like here. So uh, I know that p inverse exists. It's the p inverse times q x star equals to lambda star x star. Because x star is a, x star is a vector, lambda star is a scalar, and as we can see, this lambda star is like uh, a eigenvalue of this matrix. X star is a corresponding eigenvector of that. The p and q P inverse Q, the P is 2, 1. So inverse, the Q is 4, 1. As we said before, right? Like this. <clears throat> so that means this is just a 1 half, 1. A 4, 0, 0, 1. And this just gives us 2, 0, 0, 1. So that's P inverse Q. So if this P inverse Q is that, then the lambda star can only be 2 or 1. Right, lambda star is two or one, and then we can find the corresponding x star. So let's continue with that. If the lambda star is equal to two, then uh, the x star is the corresponding eigenvector of that. So that means uh, it also satisfies this uh, this equal to one. So it's, uh, if lambda star equals to two, then x star is the corresponding eigenvector that satisfies this. Well, the eigenvector for the lambda star is all this. Uh, one zeros, right? Because the lambda when lambda star equals to two, the the eigenspace is spanned by this. So is any is any uh, is any vector with the first component uh, arbitrary, second component zero. Okay, so this is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda star. But I also want this uh, this x star to satisfy this. This uh, sorry satisfy this equal to one. So, uh, because two p is just a, a diagonal matrix to one, then we solve this. We'll get star transpose p x star, and the x star can be uh, is specified by something like this. So it's t zero two zero zero one, and then this uh, t zero. So we get this two t square. I want this to be equal to one, so t square needs to be one half. T itself can be a square root, uh, one over square root of two, uh, plus or minus, minus. All right. 
Now that's the x star. So we can check the first order and second order uh, necessary conditions. And also, if possible, we can check the uh, sufficient conditions as well. So to do that, let's first check the tangent space at x star. So the tangent space uh, is the null space of the Jacobian. So the Jacobian matrix, this Jacobian is this right here. Uh, H is this, so the Jacobian is this, 2px, that's the Jacobian. Okay, now let's look at the Jacobian is 2 times this. So here, this is just a 2px star. And x star is like this. So 2px star is just a plus minus u2, 0. And look at the, the uh, null space of this. The null space of this is just a 0 and any vector with the first component 0 and second component arbitrary. Because when I multiply a vector like that, Let's say I multiply this by 0a, then I always get 0. It doesn't matter what a is. So that's why the null space is this. All right, this is my null space uh, of the Jacobian, which is also the tangent space x star. Okay, this is my tangent space. <clears throat> okay, now let's check the second order necessary condition. Well, uh, to check that, remember that we need to do the, uh, we need to check this, which is the, like the Haitian, uh, as we said before, it's just like we have the L of x lambda, right? And then we take the Haitian with respect to x. So this is just like that. All right. Uh, and the Haitian of f, you see the Haitian of f. So this is the f. The Haitian of this is just a negative 2q. Right? The Haitian of this is negative 2q, and the Haitian of this is positive 2 times, uh, positive p, 2p, uh, 2p. So the Haitian of this is negative 2q, the Haitian of this is 2p. Okay, that's why this is just a negative 2q, this is 2p. And then we have lambda star. So we combine them together because lambda star right now is equal to 2, so I will get this. And to check the uh, second order condition at this point x star, I just need to multiply uh, any ve vector y from this tangent space or any vector of y of this form to the two sides of this and see if it's greater than or equal to 0. So this is the matrix, and uh, the y should look like this, 0a. So I multiply 0a on the left and then 0a on the right, I'll get 2a squared. And apparently, as long as a is non zero, if a is 0, then this is 0 vector. So we only count the non-zero ones. So when it's non-zero, then this will be greater than 0, 3 greater than 0. So for any y, uh, non-zero y in the tangent space, we found that this is 3 really greater than 0. So that means the second order sufficient condition is satisfied at this point x star. And that means this x star is the local minimizer. Local minimizer of this problem. But since we are trying to maximize this, so we minimize the negative of this. So it's a minimizer of this means that it's a maximizer of that. All right, so that means that star here is a uh, strict local minimizer, uh, strict local minimizer of the constraint problem, but it's a strict local maximizer for the original problem. But as I said, we convert that into the constraint one since we, can, we know that we can freely scale uh, we have the liberty to scale this x star by any constant. So if this is the, uh, the x star, then we scale it by any uh, non-zero number. It's still a local maximizer. And that happens to be just uh, any number, uh, non-zero number t here and zero. So that's, that's our strict local maximizer. Okay, that will be our strict local maximizer of this. Okay, that's the case for lambda star equals to two. Uh, but we remember I have also have another uh, eigenvector. Uh, I also have another choice lambda star, which is equal to one. Then we're going to proceed the similar thing. We're looking for the corresponding eigenvector. So lambda star is eigenvalue. Uh, for the corresponding eigenvector, uh, we want this x star to be equal to one to satisfy this. 
let's test by this, and then we can solve the same. Uh, we can do the same procedure. In this case, we can solve for x star, and that will be uh, zero and positive negative one. And uh, the tangent space at x star will be the null space of this, which means all the vectors of this form. Where the first component is a arbitrary scalar, second component must be zero. Now we also can check this. Uh, this is like again the Hessian of L with respect to x, and then we got this matrix. Uh, Q and P are the same as before, just the lambda star right now equals to 1. We'll get this. And then we check. We get any Y from the tangent space, which is of form A0. <clears throat> we multiply it to these two sides. So we'll have A0, then this A0. Now apparently we'll get a negative 4 A0, A squared. So this is less than 0 for non zero A. So that means at this Y, this we get the local uh, at this point x star we get the local maximizer, okay? Because the this is less than zero, okay? So so you still have a second order. Actually, it's a second order sufficient condition. A uh, second order sufficient condition for local maximizer, and this is a local maximizer of the orange, of the constraint problem, and uh, we scale this by any constant. So we make this just as any other than t. Uh, scaled by any non-zero t, uh, we'll get x star as a, uh, a strict local minimizer of the original problem, of the original uh, unconstrained problem. Okay, that uh, is that is the uh, th what happens at these two uh, for these two uh, lambdas. All right. <clears throat> now let's consider another. Um, a slightly, actually a little bit special uh, constraint problem that has many applications though. So the problem is written as in this generic, uh, general way where we're trying to minimize this quadratic function uh, with the only quadratic term here. Okay, uh, you can have a linear term at the, as well. Uh, that's easy to, 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 do, to do the derivation. But let's see that we consider this case where uh, the constraint is uh, ax to do equals to b. It's a linear constraint. Linear, e, e, linear equality constraint. Okay, so this is the f of x, right? And then this ax minus b, or b minus ax, this, I want this to be equal to zero. So this h of x equals that. So again, it's minimizing f subject to hx equals zero. So the Lagrange function will be the f of x plus lambda times h of x, okay? And the Lagrange condition is the gradient with respect to x and then gradient with respect to the lambda. <clears throat> and for the second, it's just hx itself, which is equal to zero. For the first, let's take the gradient of this with respect to x. As we can see, uh, the first term gives us just the qx. And the second term, we have this lambda transpose times a in front of x. So we take the derivative with respect to x, the a transpose lambda times x. This is like a vector multiplied by x. So that's why the derivative will be just this. So the, the first one gives us this equal to zero. Now we need to solve for x and the lambda from here where q, a, and b are given. All right, so to solve this, we can first see that uh, this, uh, this first equation gives us the qx equals to a transpose lambda, right? And then because Q, uh, also sort of assume that Q is positive definite, so that means Q is invertible, that means X equals to Q inverse times A transpose lambda, all right? And now uh, we plug this back into the second equation, we'll get B minus, or B equals to AX, but the X equals to that, so it's A Q inverse A transpose lambda. All right, um, well now this A, we assume this A has uh, M rows and columns, so, and uh, A has full row rank. That is uh, necessary for X to be a regular point. It's the, the H, because the, the Jacobian of H, X is equal to negative A. And that's a M by N matrix. I want this negative A to be, uh, to have full row rank. To have a full row rank, so we can claim that this one 
is uh, positive definite. The reason is similar as before. If I want to say A is M by N, and the rank of, sorry, the M is less than or equal to N, the rank of A is, let me erase this, rank of A is equal to M, then I can claim that A uh, Q inverse A transpose is positive definite. And then first of all, this is the M by M matrix. Because Q is N by N uh, positive definite matrix. So it's M by M. And A is uh, M by N. A transpose is N by M. So this is that. So it's a positive definite matrix. The reason is when I multiply any M dimensional vector on the two sides, I have X transpose A Q inverse A transpose X. And what this one is, um, this is like I'm multiplying A transpose X as a vector to the two sides of Q inverse. Okay, and I know this must be greater than or equal to zero. The reason is the Q is positive definite. And then <clears throat> I just need to check, uh, I just need to show that when X is non zero, this must be strictly positive. And for that to hold, I just need to show that when x is non-zero, the a transpose x must be non-zero. And that's easy to show because a has full row rank, that means a transpose has full column rank. It's just like the a transpose like that. Is this uh, n by m matrix, and these columns are linear independent. So if x is a uh, non-zero vector, then the a times x will be a non-zero vector. If a times a transpose x is non-zero vector, and we have multiplied uh, a non-zero vector to the two sides of a positive definite matrix, it has to be greater than zero. Okay, that's why this uh, we multiply a non-zero x to this to the two sides of this matrix A uh, to this matrix, we get a positive number that means this matrix is, is positive definite. So this one is positive definite, so that means it's invertible. So we can solve for this lambda by taking the inverse of this matrix on both sides. We'll have lambda equals to the a q inverse a transpose inverse times b on both sides. And now this is my lambda, and then I can put this lambda back into this lambda here. I will solve for this x. So the x is just the q inverse a times the lambda, which is a uh, sorry q inverse a transpose, and this lambda is a q inverse a transpose inverse times b. So that's the solution for this problem. So we do actually have a closed form solution for this uh, kind of special uh, constraint minimization problem. But actually, we see in practice, there are many uh, applications where uh, we just, we're just solving for this such kind of problem with different q, a, and b. All right. So that's exactly the steps I, I described earlier, and uh, uh, you can go through that and see <coughs> how to use them. Use them. So now let's look at the application of the one we just got. Uh, say we're trying to minimize the uh, norm of x uh, subtract to the constraint x equals to b. Okay, so this is called the minimum minimum norm uh, solution of a linear system. We want to find the x such that this is equal to b. But since A is uh, a matrix like this, so AX, AX times, A times X equals to B has multiple solutions. Actually, it has infinitely many solutions because uh, this is M by N, and the rank is M. So, uh, and you multiply by this vector X, this is A, this is X equals to B here. Uh, so, there are infinitely many solutions for X. But we're looking for the solution that has the minimum norm. Okay, that's why it's called minimum norm solution to the linear system x is equal to b. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so what? Why this one is linked to the before? Uh, as you can see, minimizing the norm is equivalent to minimizing the square of the norm, right? Minimizing something is equivalent. Minimizing some uh, non-negative value is equivalent to minimizing some square of that. The square of that. So we can square it, 
we can divide it by one half just for convenience, but uh, you know, scale, scale, take a scaling of this function, objective function, it doesn't change the minimizer. All right, so that's why uh, we're actually equivalent to minimize this, and this is just uh, the square norm of x, just x inverse, x transpose x. So in this case, uh, the constraints as the bef as the before, and this quadratic function is just x transpose x, and that's like the Q is the identity matrix. Okay, identity matrix. And then we can use the formula we just got. So this is what we got. Uh, the x the minimizer has a closed form is equal to that, where Q is just just identity. So the inverse is also the identity. So this is just gone. This is also gone. So the solution is just this. Okay, the solution is just this one. So that means uh, if we're looking for the minimum norm solution for this linear system, then uh, it has a closed form in this way. Okay, and this is the one, as we said, it must be invertible. The reason is that uh, in for general, then for general uh, positive definite matrix Q, that was invertible. But right now, this is the first special I, it must be invertible. And that's not surprising. Again, as we said, the, if A is like this form, uh, is this, and the A transpose is this, then the product of these two is M by M full rank matrix. Okay, and it's actually uh, A, A transpose is M by M positive definite matrix, as we showed before. Right, that's why the inverse exists. Okay. Um, and now let's consider a, a interesting application of this. this is called the uh, uh, um, it's a discrete dynamic system where we have a state variable called x. Uh, at time k, time point k, and then we can take a control of that by a, by this uk, which is a control variable. It's a and b are determined by the system. Uh, probably it's because of the physics or something else that is the guide or governed by governed by the physical rule. So a and b are given numbers, and we know that if our previous state is x k minus one, uh, then the by taking the control uk, the next uh, uh, state will be xk. And the goal is to uh, modify this uk so that the xk goes to something we want, right? Uh, a special case of this is to say that we start from some x0, which is given, and we know what is a and b, and the, proper, uh, the problem is to determine the uk such that eventually for after n time points, after time n, uh, we can minimize this objective function. Okay, so this is just the dynamic system we set here. It's, uh, it's from here, right? And it's true for every k. Uh, and we're minimizing this. By the way, the why we are we call this dynamic system is because usually when we have say we have a ODE where the say, x prime is equal to something times uh, say or or um, or control u here. Um, so the that this means that the state, uh, for example, this x is our uh, speed. Uh, for example, x is our speed or velocity of the car. And uh, this U is like our uh, pedal, gas pedal. And, uh, we can push it to to increase it, to increase the, the x, to increase x. In which case, we will accelerate the car. We can also put this U as negative, which means that we brake. Uh, we press the uh, brake pedal, and we want to make, make the car slow down. Okay, so the S x is the the velocity. The x prime is acceleration. So we can control that by using this u. And uh, say we have this relation, say it's uh, x prime is equal to something times u, let's say b, b times u. So this is the x t equals to b times u t. All right? And then when we discretize this, uh, we see that x at t k, we use the x k to denote it. So one way to, to uh, solve this differential equation is to discretize it in time. So this 
new this x prime can be approximated by x of t k minus of x of uh, t k minus one divided by delta t delta t is t k minus t k minus one. I want this to be equal to b times u t k, for example. Well, um, in this case, we can say this is just a, let's say this is, a, this is a constant one, and then this is essentially just giving us this x of tk, which I use this as for shortcut, for shortcut, so it's a, this x of f sub k minus xk minus one equals to buk, right? And I can move this xk minus one to the right-hand side, I'll have xk, equals to xk minus 1 plus buk, okay? And in this case, just a equals to 1. And that is the, that's the one here, <clears throat> okay? So we discretize this. That's why we call it a discrete dynamical system. Uh, if it's this that, then it's just a continuous dynamical system. But anyway, this is linear uh, ODE that we discretize it and we need to regard this. All right, now, uh, this is what the constraint is, and we're trying to minimize this. We're trying to minimize this. Okay, uh, to minimize, so this is the a artificial objective function we are trying to minimize. So what it means is we want to somehow control the magnitude of the states at all the time points uh, weighted by Q. Q is some number that we specify or preference if we want to really minimize it. If we want to minimize this, we want to put a Q larger. Otherwise, we can put the queues uh, relatively smaller, and at the same time, we want we want to make we don't don't want to make much effort to do the control. That means, for example, we don't to, to want to uh, push the uh, gas pedal too much, too hard, or uh, push the uh, brake pedal too hard. So in this case, we want to also minimize the uh, the control magnitude we have at each step. So we want to minimize the sum of this, uh, and this Q and R uh, depend on our own preference. And this is a called this is the a the basic form of the so-called linear quadratic regulator or LQR. If you take uh, if you learn machine learning or optimal control, uh, in those contexts, uh, this is a very standard for model for you know modeling, for example, the the movement of robot or something. Uh, something like that. So this is a very, uh, very, very famous uh, model in uh, in those applications. And the question right now is that if we are given, if we're, we know what a and b are, we know the initial value x zero, and then we give the preference q and r, we we'll give the value for q and r. How to solve this system? How to find this uh, uh, uk? Especially, you get x k and u k at the same time. But actually, once you have u k, you know what the x k will be, right? Because the, the x k is determined by the u k. <clears throat> okay, the question becomes how to solve this. Well, this boils down to the uh, the uh, minimization constraint minimization problem we just discussed, uh, like this one or like like this one. Okay, let's see why that is the case. Well, to solve this, let's consider the, the variable z to contain all those variables that we're interested in. So the z contains all the x1s or xn, and also all the u1s or un. These are the unknowns. Okay, so in total there are two n unknowns, and uh, the z is a vector of two n dimension. Right, and then this q. It depends on this. Depend on this, right? So it's q times each of the xk square and r times each of the uk square. So it's pretty easy to show that uh, that, that objective function is nothing but this. Okay, so the one half is just the one half at the beginning, the z, q, z, because this q here is q times the identity matrix, n by n tag the matrix, and also this r times the tag the matrix. So if you have the z like that, what happens? Uh, I just sure can, Write this as x and this part as du. Okay, I know that both of them are n dimensional vector. So the z transpose qz 
is just uh, the x transpose the u transpose times this q. I know that the q matrix is just this. And 0 is a block diagonal matrix. Actually, it's a diagonal matrix because the, each of the bo diagonal blocks are also diagonal matrices. We have this times x u. And this becomes just a, apparently it becomes that this uh, q times x transpose i x, but i is just identity, so I just have this, plus r times uh, u transpose u. So that's just the u q times x norm squared plus r times u norm squared. This is exactly the, uh, the objective function here, right? q times x squared, you move this q outside, which is the sum of x squares, which is the norm, square norm of x. So it's store norm of x, and store no, square norm of u, and they're weighted by the q and r. So that's our projective function. And we can also convert it, convert this constraint here, because there are n of such equations, and this x, uh, xk minus 1 and uk are related in this way, and the initial x0 is given, so we can rewrite this linear constraint, into this a z equals to b, where this a is that's this matrix. Okay, it's, you can check this uh, by yourself, pretty easy. Take maybe 20 seconds to check that out. And, uh, then you have this, which uh, gives you the end b. And then solving this is this, which is, we know that this has a closed form solution, as we did before. <coughs> uh, and the closed form solution is this. Okay, so that's the general story. So the A and B, A, B, and Q are given in this way. Okay, and now uh, let's look at a concrete example for that. It's called the credit card holder's dilemma. Okay, so what this one says is, uh, suppose we have a uh, credit card and uh, we have a balance of uh, 10,000 in that, we own the bank for uh, for uh, 10,000 10, of dollars. And then we have, uh, this bank credit card has a monthly interest rate of 2%. So that means that uh, end of, at the end of each month, we'll uh, generate 2% of the remaining balance as the interest. So we all will uh, be charged for that as well. And then we uh, initially of the month, we have this as our balance. They want to make a pay payment for 10 months and see what uh, happens, uh, what we should pay for each month and uh, what we will, end up, we will end up with after 10 months. Okay, so let's say that xk is k, xk to be the balance uh, in the, in the um, uh, credit card and the uk is the amount of payment we're going to make at the month k. So xk, x0 is $10,000 which is the initial balance. Sk is the, the balance we have after the, at the end of k month. And the uk is the payment we want to make in the k month. So according to the setup we have earlier, the balance we have in the next month is the remaining balance from the last month times the one point of who, uh, which reflects the 2% interest rate. And minus the uk is uh, to subtract the payment we made in the k month. So this is the, like a dynamical system, as we uh, mentioned before. At the same time, we want to minimize uh, the we want to minimize the balance for each month, and I also want to ma minimize the payment. We don't want to make a you know payment uh, a large payment. Uh, that's our purpose right now. Uh, so let's say that the purpose is to minimize it. Apparently, there are other ways to 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 uh, to set up the objective function. Maybe you don't care about the uh, balance in the middle, you only care what you uh, paid at the end, paid in the, during the, what you paid uh, at each month and what you end up with uh, in the balance. So maybe you're only interested in x10, not uh, any other x case, not x1 through x9. Uh, and you want to minimize the balance here, um, minimize the payment here. <coughs> And maybe you can also pay put a different uh, different rates for each of these UKs. Maybe you have an RK for each UK. But let's say that we're uh, let's say we're just interested in solving this. Um, and this is the typical 
it's just exactly the same application as before, like this one, right? Uh, it's just that we know that A is equal to 1.02, B is equal to negative 1, and then we can set up the U and Q and R. So the Q and R, again, let's, uh, it's, you can, we can interpret the meaning of Q and R very easily. Uh, we, if we don't want to have a, a big balance uh, remaining in the bank, in, remaining in the account, then we want to put a larger Q. Okay. According to the book, that says that the more anxious, uh, anxious, anxious we are to reduce the, our debt, then we should put larger Q here. Try to minimize this XK. Uh, on the other hand, if we want, don't want to make a large payment, uh, then we want to put this R large. Okay, and uh, that depends on the choices of Q and R, we'll get a set of results. Okay, so for example, uh, we choose Q to be 1, R to be 10. So in this case, R is relatively small compared to Q, meaning that we really want to minimize the balance. Uh, and we can try to uh, make a large payment. And in this case, when we set the Q equals 1, R equals 10, then we solve for this X and Q. We found that uh, we are going to make a payment uh, in the 10 months like this. And then the balance we have at the end of each month will be like this. Okay, so that's good. Uh, uh, we do need to make a large payment. Like for the first month, we we'll almost make a $3,000 payment. But later on, we, we reduce up to the $8. But at the end of 10th month, we will uh, just have uh, just owe the bank for eight hundred dollars. Uh, but if we don't want to make a large payment, then we pay the put a very large weight in front of the payment. R set R to three hundred compared to R equals ten. Then we do not need to pay a lot. Uh, we only pay like a hundred, few hundred dollars at the beginning, and even later when we come to just pay this. But then we barely reduce the balance. And uh, the balance is always near the 10,000. Eventually, at the end of 10 months, we even owe the, the, the bank more than 10,000 than we had initially. Okay, So that's just the different choices of uh, R we, we choose, and then we can get generally different results. But this is very special. It's just exactly following uh, the example as before. But as I said, you can try to set up different Q and R here. You can even assign uh, different values Q to different X case, or UK, R, different R to different U case. Uh, does depend on your application or your pre preference, what you're trying to minimize. Then you can do the same procedure as before uh, to find the minimizer. Okay, that's the uh, that's this uh, example uh, 